Hello and welcome to the Inside Intelligence event series brought to you by the Johns Hopkins University Master of Science in Intelligence Analysis and the Office of Advanced Academic Programs. Today's event features Itai Shapira discussing strategic intelligence and Israeli perspective. My name is Peter Huggins and I'm the event producer. Please note today's program will be recorded and uploaded to the AAP YouTube channel under the MS in Intelligence Analysis playlist. During the program, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A function and we'll answer as many questions as possible during the latter portion of the event. With that, I will turn over the event to the host of our program, Dr. Michael Ard. Thank you, Peter, and welcome everybody. Welcome to Inside Intelligence. Uh, we're glad to have Atai Shapira with us today. Let me introduce him. Colonel Shapira has more than 25 years of experience in the Israeli defense intelligence, where he has served in various intelligence analysis and management roles on the strategic, operational, and tactical levels. His last assignments included the Deputy for Analysis in the IDI's Research and Analysis Division, the head of the Syrian Department of the RAD, and the head of the IDI's Devil's Advocate Department. He holds a BA and MBA from Tel Aviv University and is a graduate of the Israeli National Defense College. He is currently a PhD candidate at the University of Leicester, studying Israeli national intelligence culture. And he's published articles in Intelligence and Strategy in Intelligence and National Security Journal, War on the Rocks, Defense One, Small Worlds Journal, and RUSI Commentary and other platforms. He's also a red team leader at Red Team Thinking. Welcome, Ty. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Michael. Uh, very excited to be here. Um, so really, it's really an honor for me to be here and I'll um, try to speak in about 20 or 25 minutes uh, to share with you my perspectives about uh, strategic intelligence from an Israeli point of view. This is based both on my uh, practical experience in the Israeli defense intelligence, but also on my current PhD research about the Israeli national intelligence culture. Before we start, I do want to mention just a few or one general issue about the Israeli intelligence community. First of all, uh, the Israeli intelligence community is comprised of three major organizations. The Israeli defense intelligence or military intelligence, which you can see here in the middle, the Mossad, the Foreign Intelligence and Special Operations Organizations, which you can see here on the left, and the Israeli Security Agency, and known in Hebrew as Shabak, in charge of uh, domestic uh, intelligence, counterintelligence, counterinsurgency, and counterespionage. Before we get to these organizations, I do want to mention that in Israel, as in Israel, the Israeli intelligence community is not defined by law as such. There is no national management of the Israeli intelligence community there are no obligatory rules for cooperation or coordination. But, and I'll try to discuss this as we go along, in Israel, there is usually a big difference between de facto and de jure. The fact that there is no statutory national intelligence community does not mean that there is no such. There is a great level of cooperation between Israeli intelligence cultures. I would uh, compare this, by the way, in Israel, there is no formal written public national security doctrine, and yet there is a very powerful informal national security doctrine. Anyway, when we discuss the Israeli intelligence, I would like to mention again that the Israeli Defense Intelligence, where I serve, is a very unique organization. It is a military intelligence, a military directorate in the IDF, Israeli Defense Forces General Staff, but this is also the defense intelligence, and in many aspects, it is also a national level intelligence in charge of analysis, collection, and special operation. Uh, the Mossad on the left is a foreign intelligence agency, but mainly a special operations agency. Mossad director is not only head of an intelligence agency, but also a strategic advisor to the prime minister and a special envoy for the prime minister. Mossad mainly engages countering adversary weapons of mass destruction projects, such as the Iranian one in the last year. The Israeli security agency, Shabak, is also a domestic intelligence agency, but mainly an operational agency in charge of counterintelligence, counterespionage, 
counterinsurgency and counterterrorism. The director of Shabak, again, besides being an intelligence agency director, is also a strategic advisor to the prime minister and a special envoy. The directors of Mossad and Shabak are subordinate directly to the Israeli prime minister. The director of the military intelligence is formally subordinate to the IDF chief of staff, but informally, and again in Israel, informally has a lot of importance, also a subordinate to the Minister of Defense and to the Prime Minister. So this is just really a general overview of Israel intelligence. Many intelligence communities, of course, suffer for traumas. The major trauma of Israeli intelligence, which I think is important to discuss this as a background for our discussion about strategic intelligence, is the colossal uh, early warning failure, failure of the Yom Kippur War in 1972. I'm not going to discuss the specifics of this intelligence failure, but I do want to mention a few aspects of this trauma. First of all, you see here two chiefs of the Israeli Defense Intelligence, Aaron Yariv, known as Arale. He was the head of the Defense Intelligence until 1972, replaced by Eli Zeira, this individual, who was accused of being highly responsible for the intelligence failure not because he wasn't a professional. He was an amazing professional. Main issues for this colossal failure were issues of arrogance, of the need for cognitive closure, and a lack of critical thinking. This is a trauma Israeli intelligence is still coping with. This individual here is called Tzvi Zamir. He was then the head of the Mossad in 1973. In 1973, Israel understood that the military and defense intelligence cannot have a monopoly on strategic intelligence. There is a need for competition. And then Mossad became much more powerful in terms of strategic intelligence and strategic analysis. This individual here on the right is back then Colonel Yoel Ben Torat. Yoel Ben Torat was the head of the SIGINT unit. The SIGINT unit now in Israel known as 8200, then it was named Unit 848. A dramatic crisis between collection and analysis in Israeli intelligence has endured since. This gentleman criticized the analyst saying, we, the SIGINT unit provided all the information and the analyst failed. As we go along, I would like to discuss these three uh, uh, aspects of trauma, a lack of critical thinking, a need for competition between agencies for strategic intelligence, and the need to balance collection analysis as we go along. I do want to mention very briefly some of the strategic challenges that Israel faces, because naturally strategic intelligence has to serve or support the need to engage these strategic challenges. So first of all, when you look in the Middle East, naturally in the last few decades, the major strategic challenges for Israel stems from Iran, in terms of Iran's military nuclear project, in terms of Iranian proxies, such as the Houthis in Yemen or Hezbollah in Lebanon, in terms of Iranian proliferation, in terms of Iranian military capabilities and Iranian cyber. Besides, of course, Iran, Israel is constantly preparing for hybrid military conflicts with two major adversaries. Uh, the map does not really illustrate this, but Hezbollah, the Shiite organization here in Lebanon, and Hamas, the Sunni organization here in the Gaza Strip. This neighborhood of Israel is rather volatile. We all remember what is called the Arab Spring in 2010, 2011, when regimes have become unstable. By the way, as I will show you a bit later, in Israel, this phenomenon was never called the Arab Spring. It was called the turmoil, let me something a bit more, I think, uh, pessimistic. So challenges here stemming mainly from Iran, but also from Syria and Lebanon and the Gaza Strip. Challenges uh, discussing weapons of mass destruction, military aspects, and of course, terrorism. But there are also opportunities. And as you all know, the Middle East has dramatically changed. Israel in the last year has new agreements with the Emirates, with Bahrain, with Morocco. And for several decades, Israel has peace with Egypt and with Jordan. So it is a rather unique neighborhood. On top of that, Strategic intelligence for Israel also entail understanding what is the Russian influence in the Middle East, mainly over Syria. What is the Chinese influence over the Middle East, mainly regarding Iran, but not only. And even issues such as climate change, 
But as I will mention later, this is engaged in a much more minor way than in the US. So these are just a few examples of strategic uh, challenges. And I do want to, want to mention what I think when the Israelis think and practice strategic intelligence, what are the major traits of it? First of all, as I mentioned, this is very different from the American intelligence community. In Israel, there are no formal or public national intelligence estimates, whether the US is sometimes mentioned as NIE or ICA, or in the UK, for example, JIC papers, Joint Intelligence Committee. In Israel, there are no formal or public national intelligence estimates. There is no one organization formally in charge of the national intelligence estimate although the IDI, where I serve, sees itself as a national estimate. Israeli strategic intelligence still focuses very much on traditional national security issues, weapons of mass destruction, military proliferation, terrorism, not so much <clears throat> about climate change <clears throat> or energy or global pandemics. Something very unique to Israel, Israeli culture, Israeli strategic intelligence <clears throat> is treated as something that should be actionable. I think also a, probably a bit different from the US, very much integrated with policy and strategy in terms of individual, individuals, but also in terms of processes, strategic intelligence. Israelis, by the way, do not at least explicitly use the term speak truth to power. They, they do do this, but they don't use this phrase. And the whole uh, purpose of strategic intelligence is to be embedded and integrated into policy and strategy. One of the reasons, by the way, is that Israel's strategic culture rests on a basic assumption that Israel has to prevent existential threats from materializing, such as adversary nuclear projects. Intelligence, of course, and strategic intelligence is the first line of defense. But intelligence, strategic intelligence in Israel is not meant only to enable forming a strategy and executing it. Psychologists would probably call this, I would say, inherent schizophrenia. Strategic intelligence is the one or the mechanism which should identify when the strategy is, not on, is no longer working, when it has become obs obsolete. While in the past, Israeli intelligence focused very much on strategic early warning for war, naturally, uh, challenges have uh, a bit changed. And mainly, I would say now, strategic intelligence in Israel deals with identifying the emergence of unintended escalations, not stemming uh, uh, not, not stemming necessarily from an actual uh, intent of an adversary. Strategic intelligence in Israel, as in other countries, has to discuss partners and allies, not only adversaries. Strategic intelligence has to analyze, not collect, of course, but has to analyze the broad environment. And in Israel, as in many other intelligence communities, there is a potential, there is a risk that strategic intelligence might be overshadowed by operational and targeting intelligence, which uses the best technology, uh, the best platforms, the best, the best tools. Uh, the decision makers naturally give much attention to operational targeting intelligence. Strategic intelligence has a risk of being left, being a bit overshadowed. I would like, just like to mention here a few examples. Examples for how strategic intelligence in Israel identifies strategic trends as they begin to emerge and then allows a formulation and then an execution of strategy. Israel about a decade ago understood that in Syria, what's going on is not just a civil war. The Iranians and Hezbollah are trying to entrench themselves in Syria and to take the opportunity to build military infrastructures in Syria. This is a trend that had just begun to emerge, identified by strategic intelligence. And then Israel uh, uh, began what's called in Israel, in a bad translation from Hebrew to English, the campaign between the wars. Uh, not to be confused with the gray zone, this is a campaign uh, uh, comprised also of kinetic strikes intended to counter Iranian influence in the Middle East. And another development, a decade ago, Israel understood that there is a camp in the Middle East, not formally defined as such, but there is a group of Sunni pragmatic states, which Israel has many, many uh, shared interests with, such as, of course, Egypt, Jordan, but also Saudi Arabia, the Emirates, and Bahrain and Morocco. And perhaps this is what led to this, for me as an Israeli, this amazing picture about a year ago, 
of Israelis and Emiratis and Moroccans and Bahrainis signing the Abraham Accords. So these are examples of Israeli strategic intelligence. And again, there are no formal documents. This is my interpretation of how strategic intelligence in Israel identifies trends as they begin to emerge and then allows an execution, a formulation execution of a strategy. But there were many cases where strategic intelligence had a very minor influence over strategic decisions in Israel. The dramatic peace agreement between Israel and Egypt in the late, late 1970s. Uh, this is Menachem Begin, the Israeli prime minister. He did not consult the military intelligence. Military intelligence thought this would not work, that the Egyptians are probably trying to deceive Israel. Uh, this is the uh, attack on the Iraqi nuclear, uh, uh, nuclear reactor in 1981. Menachem Begin, by the way, was again the prime minister. These are the you know, photos from the cockpit. Most intelligence directors uh, objected to this strike. They thought this would cause a major escalation in the Middle East. The prime minister uh, uh, still made that decision. This is the peace agreement you know, it's Chak Rabin, of course, President Clinton and Yasser Arafat, the peace agreement with the Palestinians, 1993. Intelligence was not consulted. The chief of Israeli military intelligence at the time, General Uri Sagi, even sent a letter to the prime minister protesting about how intelligence was ignored. This is Prime Minister Ehud Barak at the time, in 2000, deciding to withdraw Israeli forces from South Lebanon. Intelligence was not consulted and objected but the prime minister still made that decision. So the picture is mixed. And I would say that Israelis think of a holistic approach to strategic intelligence. I would frame this as strategic intelligence with many, many aspects of what sometimes is called also operational tactical intelligence. This is a Syrian nuclear reactor that Israel strike on uh, September, 2007, before and after. But of course, I, I mentioned that in Israel, strategic intelligence is not just about you know, mysteries and puzzles. It is also about understanding strategic secrets. So strategic intelligence in Israel had to understand what is this nuclear reactor meant to do? This is a picture published by an, Israeli, by a, an American newspaper. An Israeli special operation, they gained the access to the, to the uh, uh, construction of that military uh, nuclear reactor. And strategic intelligence had to also discuss mysteries and puzzles. When Israel would strike that new actor, how would the Syrian president respond? So it's a holistic approach to strategic intelligence with aspects of operational tactical intelligence. And I just want to pose a question. Should strategic intelligence, and this is a debate in Israel, should it support strategy or criticize strategy? This is Prime Minister Netanyahu a few years ago. Uh, you remember that the, uh, it was published that the Mossad had a heroic operation in Iran, bringing Iranian nuclear archives, which are presented here. This allowed the prime minister to say, Iran lied. Iran is lying to the world. Is this strategic intelligence, although it's a special operation? Perhaps. <laughs> These are former directors. This is Yuval Diskin, former director of Shabak. This is the late Mayor Dagan, the former director of Mossad. They both, in 2012, objected to an Israeli strike on Iranian nuclear facilities. They criticized the Israeli strategy. So should strategic intelligence support the strategy or criticize this? I'm just leaving this as an open question. So while I would like to, to <clears throat> leave this as a few questions for us, <clears throat> I think I mentioned that the Israeli approach to strategic intelligence, it is unique. It is somewhat an intersection of strategic, political, organizational, and my favorite, naturally, an intelligence culture. I think the topics I've discussed are just a, a, a very you know, narrow and short example of how important it is to conduct comparative research of national intelligence culture, not just in the Anglosphere, not just in the US and the UK. And of course, for those of you who like the famous Escher pictures, I think that it is very important to discuss the broad philosophical foundations of strategic intelligence. Abduction, sometimes referred to as the best, the best explanation for a surprising event. I think, as I mentioned in Israel, strategic intelligence should be somewhere here. Recognizing shifts as they begin to emerge. And strategic intelligence is not just about speaking truth to power. It's also like these pair of glasses. A glasses 
for the decision makers to look at the reality and then try to make sense of it. So I hope this was uh, a good uh, basis or foundation for our discussion. Uh, thank you very much for your time. And I hope now we'll have a good discussion, a bit disagreements and arguments as we usually like. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for that great uh, presentation. And uh, uh, to our, uh, and all those who have joined us, uh, please put your questions in the Q&A or the chat, and we'll be getting to them very shortly. Now, I'm gonna, let's start out with a question. One of the things that really jumps out when you talk about, you know, it's very informal, uh, the authorities are informal, and you have um, uh, a, a situation where you're very much embedded with policy. So how do we talk about politicization in this context, or do we? I think it's one of, for me at least, I think it's one of the most in intriguing topics. Um, I think I've mentioned that the, there's a great article I've read by Professor Uri Bar Yosef, who's one of the doyans of, of Israel intelligence. And I think that in Israel, there is some sort of, and this is what also he describes, there is some sort of paradox. While in Israel, strategic intelligence is really embedded in strategy and policy, relatively speaking, including relative to the US and the UK, the issue of politicization is rather minor. Not, I'm not saying that there are no such cases, but I think my personal opinion, I think this has to be mostly with the, less of the intelligence culture, but mainly with the political culture. For example, in the US, the DNI, the Director of National Intelligence is a political appointee. In Israel, not only there is no DNI, Israelis cannot think of a political appointee managing or directing the intelligence community. The political culture is that intelligence should be totally apolitical. And I think that if you take this aspect of political culture and you combine this a bit with the Israeli culture, I'll use just a few words in Hebrew, not too much, but there's one word in Hebrew that's been you know, immigrated to, to English called chutzpah, which is something between being, uh, uh, I don't know how I can say, too uh, frank or too candid. I think that the, in, in Israel writ large, but specifically in Israeli intelligence, uh, the culture, and this is how I was trained and how I was educated, the culture of being contrary, being disruptive, being critical, I think this also reduces the, uh, uh, the risk for politicization. Now, I'm not saying that there are no such cases, but for Israeli officers, and this is the education that we have received, uh, uh, whether you're a two-star general or you're a first lieutenant, it is not your, you know, uh, it is your duty to say what you think. I can tell you just a small anecdote. When I was ahead of the devil's advocate uh, uh, department or the red teaming advocate, uh, red teaming department, and again, I'm not unique in that, the head of the devil's advocate department can publish an intelligence paper about whatever subject he or she chooses to discuss and can send that paper with no authorization to the chief of the defense intelligence, to the chief of general staff, to the minister of defense, to the prime minister. Now you can say that it is a bit chaotic. It is, but there is also an upside to it. And again, this is a culture of permitting contrary and disruptive thinking. And again, I think this reduces a bit the risk of politicization. Yeah, I mean, that's always been a live question uh, here, especially in the intelligence community in the US on, and our academic writers who look at it and there's a lot of debate on it. So it's really interesting to get your perspective on that. But you also mentioned a little bit earlier on, you know, uh, about um, intelligence failure, right? So, uh, and of course, you know, 1973 is always pointed out the big one, uh, part, partially intelligence failure, partly, uh, not right. We know it's more, it's, it's a lot more complicated than that. But there are some others, right? That uh, that uh, the community in Israel has learned from. Can you mention a few of those? Yes. Um, for first of all, for Mossad and Shabak, some of the intelligence failures are actually operational or even ethical failures. Mm -hmm. uh, for Shabak, the most uh, famous one or infamous one is in 1984. What's called Line 300. Where two, uh, uh, where two terrorists were captured and then uh, killed 
and this was a, dr a dramatic, uh, mainly ethical issue uh, uh, for Shabak. And of course, the failure to provide early warning and to foil the assassination of Prime Minister Rabin right. on the 4th of November, 1995. Every Israeli remembers that dreadful uh, date. So these are uh, dramatic intelligence uh, operational phases. Shabak also has a, a failure of not anticipating what's called the first Palestinian Intifado uprising in 1987. But I would say that most of its failures are mostly operational ones. Mossad operational failures naturally, Mossad and Shabak are very covert organizations, but also failed, failed assassinations or failed, failed operations are considered uh, you know, examples of failure. The Israeli military intelligence, 1973, by the way, is a trauma of, uh, I would say, by the way, I, uh, I was born after the Yom Kippur War, not to mention my you know, exact age. I was born after the Yom Kippur War. And every minute of my military service, I lived the trauma of the Yom Kippur War. But the younger generation in Israeli military intelligence have a new trauma which is the, uh, uh, what's called the second Lebanese war in 2006. Mm -hmm. The major intelligence failure there was operational and tactic, meaning on the strategic level, strategic intelligence was rather uh, accurate and actionable in terms of understanding what's going on in Lebanon and what are the intentions and even capabilities of Hezbollah. But the division commanders and the brigade commanders and the battalion commanders on the ground have received very, very partial intelligence. And that is a trauma. So this is an example of an intelligence failure. And there are others, for example, uh, uh, the first uh, or the only case that Israel found out about a Libyan nuclear program was when the US in 2003, if I can recall correctly, had a diplomatic agreement with Libya. Israel had no idea. There was an, uh, you know, an inquiry committee in Israel. So I would say some failures of early warning in the last few years, mainly failures of uh, operational and tactical intelligence. And for Mossad and Shabak, more operational and even ethical issues. And we all live through these traumas. I think these are very, very influential. I can tell you, I'll just end with this. I mentioned earlier Yoel Ben-Torat in 1973 and the great clash between collection analysis. Uh, I retired three years ago. So, you know, this is like a few decades after the Yom Kippur War. Uh, uh, in some cases, these are the same sentences that were used in the clashes between collection analysis in 1973. So look how, uh, you know, how trauma endures. You have a, an intelligence community in Israel that's very sharply defined by roles. You, you know, you're fortunate enough to have only three organizations, right? Uh, but how well, do they, how well do they cooperate? How well do they share? I think that, first of all, I mentioned there is no formal mechanism. Uh, although in Israel, there's a mechanism called Varash. Varash is the committee of the heads of services, Mossad, Shabak, and the IDEA, which meet on an occasional basis. They mostly discuss special operations and not like the US, for example, you have a national intelligence strategy. There is no such formal document in Israel as a national intelligence strategy. So there is no formal cooperation. There is no intelligence community assessment. I would mention that my research has shown that Israelis have an aversion towards the idea of one or unitarian national intelligence assessment. They and Israel decision makers, which some of them I interviewed says, we like the fact that there are different intelligence assessment. We don't need one unitary. So no formal mechanism for cooperation, for coordination, or for an intelligence assessment. But, and I think this is very uh, typical of Israeli culture, a dramatic cooperation between all organizations on the tactical level, mainly bottom up and not top down. For example, uh, I think Israel is very, I won't say innovative, but rather advanced in uh, joint projects of collection and analysis. You know, things like that, of course, have been done in the CIA and in DIA and NGA, and also in, in the British intelligence community, but I think Israel is rather advanced. Most of the projects were tested for counterterrorism operations 
uh, and they emerged in an Israeli fashion, not with a theory and doctrine and then implementation, but, by, but really on the opposite level of implementation on the tactical level between young officers, young analysts, young signatures, and young operational officers from Shabak to counter, for example, operational uh, Palestinian terrorism. So I think the cooperation and coordination on the tactical level is very, very uh, robust, but not structured, not formalized. And on the assessment, I would say not only uh, is, you know, there's no formal mechanism, most of the heads or all these three directors of agencies, Shabak, Mossad, and the IDI, see themselves as totally independent. They cannot think of, of a concept where they are managed or directed by a supreme authority. Uh, and I think, again, this is very Israeli. It's a combination of contrarian and critical thinking and a lot of uh, operational necessity, which brings a great uh, bottom-up uh, cooperation between the agents. Now, of course, there have been many clashes between the organizations, but the clashes are mainly between the high-level officers. I've seen dozens, not you know, hundreds of cases of bottom-up cooperation coordination between young officers. It's Israel, it's a small country. Many of the people know each other. Uh, again, it's, it's an Israeli uh, uniqueness, right. appropriate for Israel, for a small country. Small community. Small yeah. community, right. small country. Right. Not he doesn't have global problems. Yeah. Okay. That, that's thanks for that answer. And now let's get to our questions. We have many questions, um, both in Q and A and the chat. Thank you for those, and we'll get to them now. Um, uh, Kevin asks Shapira, doesn't this purpose of strategic intelligence do both support and challenge strategy? Shouldn't that? Shouldn't there it be doing both of those? My personal opinion. And, and the way I was raised and my research has shown that in Israel, the perception is that it should do both. Uh, I can tell you from, from a personal experience, uh, when I was the head of the Syrian department, yes, I was expected to identify when we have, when the Israeli strategy has an opportunity to conduct, to conduct unique actions in Syria. I, the strategic intelligence had to guide the production of operational tactical intelligence. Mm -hmm. And I was the one who was also expected to tell my general officers, the strategy has become obsolete. So I definitely think, and many Israeli uh, high ranking officers think that strategic intelligence should do all. There is a pitfall in that. Uh, naturally, if you support a strategy and not only do you support a strategy, you enable its execution, you become emotionally committed. That's right. I think this is only natural. We Israelis, again, it's appropriate for a small country, not a superpower, not with global issues. We are educated to deal with this, not through protocol and directives, but through ethics and education. Uh, and it creates problems, but I think, yes, it definitely should do all of these. And I've seen many examples of my commanding officers and even myself standing with a two-star general or even with the Minister of Defense or Prime Minister and saying, this is how my intelligence assessment supports the production of operation technical intelligence, but I think the strategy has become obsolete. All right, thank you. Uh, question on red teaming, we knew that uh, yes, this would come up, right? Let's talk about red teaming. So um, could we uh, could speak a little bit more about the practice of Israeli red teaming, uh, how they go about it, how they go about it, and um, maybe what are some of the lessons for us? Yes, uh, I, would, I would differentiate between two aspects. The first one is the formal. Uh, in the Israeli defense intelligence, but also, by the way, in the other organizations, there are small, very, very, very small departments, red team departments, which are intended to conduct alternative analysis. Uh, in the, this is a lesson of the Yom Kippur War. Uh, this department was established in 1974 and 1975. So one aspect is a former small department, which its main, I would say, power is, uh, is derived from the fact that it received a total, even, you know, inconceivable, inconceivable freedom 
from the chief of defense intelligence. Again, to discuss any aspect. But I think more importantly, in Israeli defense intelligence, but also in other organizations, is the cultural education for red teaming or for contrary analysis in every other aspect. And I think one of the lessons I've learned is that you have to combine, you have to have a formal small red team department such as the IDI does. But what's more important, you have to have a red team culture. And I think the most successful projects of devil's advocate of red teaming I've experienced from some of my, some of my colleagues, the Israel experience is, is, I think the Israeli practices have a dedicated small red team department, gather individuals from the units themselves to assist in the red team. Sometimes, you know, people mistake the devil's advocate for the devil. You know, this is wrong. This is right. just the devil's advocate. So I think this is one of the lessons. Combine an education of contrarian culture with a small dedicated team, which must enjoy total freedom. I've enjoyed that. My predecessors and my successors have enjoyed total freedom. Uh, I think this is, this is the key aspect. Very good. Uh, another question. If Israel focuses exclusively on traditional national security issues, does it not run the risk of missing the bigger picture? Now, how can you safeguard against this? Um, uh, first of all, you know, it's, it's not only on traditional national security issues, it's mostly uh, naturally because of resources and I think because of strategic culture, you know, the Israeli strategic culture, we Israelis live under a feeling of existential threats and uh, uh, everything is urgent. So it's not only, but mostly, I would definitely say that there is a risk of missing the big picture. Um, you know, climate change is an example, global pandemics is an example, but I think what might, might just a little bit compensate for that is the agility and the ability to improvise. Mm -hmm. For example, the Israel intelligence community naturally had no collection and almost no analysis on the issue of global pandemics prior to COVID, naturally. But when this had emerged, uh, the Israeli intelligence community, uh, IDI, Shabak, and Mossad have formed unique organizations uh, which have conducted, not collection, but analysis. Uh, and this was improvisational with no statutory you know, uh, 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 responsibility, with no law. Uh, but I definitely think that there is a risk. The issue in Israel is always, and I think, again, it's a strategic culture of living under, uh, you know, a siege mentality and existential threat. It's always the issue of resources. Can we put resources on understanding energy and climate change and global pandemics right. when we have to prepare for war with Hezbollah and to foil right. the Iranian nuclear project? It always comes down to this. Again, I think it's a very Israeli mindset well i mean it was uh, you mentioned i mean this was to focus on traditional problems i mean it's, it's a scarcity issue right you just have to you have to put the uh uh also where the community can really add value also you know there may be other sources that are better uh, another question what is what do you think is the is uh, israel learning from the ukraine conflict and how this might apply to its own national security objectives I think from, from what I see, first of all, many, many lessons are drawn on the operational and tactical level. And there are many scholars in Israel who have already started writing uh, something like, uh, you know, we all know that this is 21st century information warfare and cyber and everything, but, but let's not abandon our intelligence capabilities and therefore our operational capabilities to deal with uh, more traditional warfare of tanks, and artillery, and air power, and air superiority, and attrition warfare. And I think in that, Israel, Israel is learning that uh, it's while Israel and the IDF mostly is definitely engages issue of advanced technologies and digital transformation, and of course, AI, AI and cyber, uh, there is a need to maintain strategic and operational capabilities for more traditional warfare. And the second thing, I'm, I don't know if Israelis are learning, but I do see that Israelis are discussing this issue. What can we understand about Russia? It's no secret that the Israeli policy towards Russia has been debatable in the West because Israel was under concern 
that if Russia would criticize the Israeli policy towards Ukraine, Russia might uh, minimize and limit the Israeli freedom of action in Syria. You know, the Russians have a great presence in Syria and Israel is conducting a military campaign in Syria. And uh, I think that this issue is debatable. Perhaps the Russian intentions and capabilities were overestimated in this sense. By the way, in the West, I think many other scholars, I think perhaps the Russians were overestimated and the Ukrainians were underestimated. So I think in this aspect, what the Israel is beginning to think, how should we think of a superpower like Russia and its influence? Now Israelis are thinking about Russian influence in Syria, but the main issue I think, uh, and this is a question discussed in Israel, what would really be the Russian support for Iran after the Ukrainian crisis? Again, it's a question debated in Israel. So I think the learning has just, uh, has just uh, uh, begun. And Israeli are fo Israelis are following very closely. Uh, you know, there's so much public information out there. Right. Uh, next question. Uh, does the lack of any formalized doctrine create any challenges toward democratic control of intelligence agencies in Israel? Oh, oh that's a tough right. one. This is in your wheelhouse. This is in your wheelhouse. Uh, this is a tough one. Yeah. I think that in the Israeli mentality, um, it does not create a challenge, but I would say two things. First of all, <clears throat> civilian oversight over the Israeli intelligence community, and again, I mentioned there is no formal intelligence community. This is just a phrase we use. Civilian oversight uh, is not so strong, for example, as in the US. The IDI, by the way, operates under the IDF, so there's a law for the IDF. For Shabak, there is a law. Mossad does not operate, there is no law no statutory uh, issues for Mossad. You cannot see in Israel, like you know, in the US, you have these two stars and three stars and directors of energies testifying before, before Congress. There are almost no such cases in Israel. Uh, so civilian oversight in terms of uh, uh, intelligence assessment or collection is not so robust, uh, but I think that the Israelis, and this is part of my research, Israelis do not perceive a structured or formalized or written doctrine as the key for a successful process. Again, I mentioned in Israel, take US for example, you have the national security strategy, the national defense strategy, the national military strategy, you have the national intelligence strategy, you have the homeland security strategy. <clears throat> in Israel, none of these documents exist, but there is a informal oral national security doctrine. By the way, it rests on four major pillars, deterrence, battlefield decision, early warning, and defense. And so Israelis do not perceive doctrine and formalization as a condition for successful processes, but I do agree that this creates a challenge for civilian oversight. Definitely, it does create a challenge. Another question. And, uh... Do you think there's more of a consensus between the parties in Israel, and there's a lot of parties, <laughs> on national security, more of a consensus on national security than there is in the US? I think that, um, again, not, not really my expertise, but I think that on some issues of national security, like Iran, for example, there's writ large a consensus. On some issues of national security, like, for example, the amazing Abraham Accord, you know, with the Emirates and Bahrain and Morocco, a large consensus. There is the Palestinian issue, which is uh, uh, very debatable in Israel. The Israeli parties and the Israeli society is very polarized. Uh, but I would say that national security or even defense and military issues are writ large uh, under consensus. Uh, in Israeli political culture, again, the IDF, and of course the Mossad and Shabak, have someone been able to remain, I would say, rather or relative, unharmed by politicization. And some of these institutions are uh, uh, even considered a, a, you know, an example for successful institutions in Israel. Um, so I would say, yes, that some of the issues are not really debatable. The Palestinian issue on almost every aspect, you know, not in issues of the 
uh, counterterrorism operation. But on the strategic level, the Palestinian issue is very, very debatable, has been since 1967, maybe even prior to that. It's a great question. It's a, an interesting topic. When we talk about, here's another one, that, you know, strategic intelligence in Israel, how far out uh, do the um, uh, conceptual, how far out do they like to conceptualize that? A year, two years? Uh, for those of you who like to read, you know, the Nick, uh, or what was then called the Nick uh, Global Trends, you would not right. find, you would not find Global Trends 2040 uh, documents in Israel. Uh, but it's not just the issue of, of documents. First of all, strategic intelligence in Israel relatively tries to look to the short and medium range and not too much to the long range. Again, I think it, it's an illustration of strategic culture, existential species mentality. And another aspect, uh, many scholars, uh, for those of you who like you know, issues of uh, military culture, military innovation, many scholars have differentiated in terms of military aspect between what's called innovation through anticipation, meaning you anticipate the future, for example, the future of warfare, and then you try how you design your force, and innovation through adaptation, where you constantly you know, practice and adapt, practice and adapt. I would say that the Israeli strategic and military and intelligence culture is more inclined towards innovation through adaptation. Israelis usually perceive practice as preceding theory. It's not that they have an aversion towards theory, but they usually practice uh, preceding theory. By the way, it's very interesting to think of the fact that in Israel, which I think, you know, intelligence and strategic aspects are a real challenge. In Israel, we're not Johns Hopkins, MS in intelligence studies. In Israel, there is no academic intelligence studies program. Not one. Well, there are courses about intelligence, but not one academic intelligence studies program. I, well, I to, our friends out, to our friends out there in Israel, we are an online program and applications are being accepted as we speak. Thank you very much. Um, thanks for that opening there. I appreciate it. Uh, <laughs> how about um, the, uh, okay, we mentioned earlier, Paul asked about the political appointees element, right? And that, and that of course, is uh, uh, very common in the U.S. Uh, over our intelligence community, but not so much in Israel. So. Is that, and is this just the sense of their professionalization or are there other reasons for this? I think mostly, first of all, again, there, there are you know, some debatable issues. For example, the directors of Mossad and Shabak, you know, they are subordinate directly to the prime minister and they are appointed by the prime minister. Uh, um, but they are not political appointees. First of all, they are all professional, mainly, you know, most of them have been raised in this specific organization. And I think in the Israeli political and intelligence culture, intelligence institutions, uh, the, what you've mentioned, Mike, Michael, the uh, uh, professionalization is like a sacred institution. Mm -hmm. I think Israelis really fear, even the politicians themselves, maybe I'm a bit too optimistic about that, but this is what I found out in my research. Even the politicians themselves fear of intelligence institutions being run and therefore perceived as being influenced by politics. Now, there are cases, you know, the former Mossad director, for example, Yossi Cohen, prior to that, he was a national security advisor of Prime Minister Netanyahu. So in Israel, some people said, yes, he's a political appointee. I think uh, the case is different. This is a professional, you know, you might criticize his, his actions, but this is a professional. And yes, I think, Intelligence institutions in Israel are perceived that let's leave them, let's leave politics out of them and let's leave them out of politics. Professionalization is the first priority. Uh, question from Jim Poole, and let me uh, summarize this, but the idea here is without having a um, ODNI or JIC chairman equivalent in Israel, how do you coordinate collection among the different brain, uh, services? So collection, uh, collection and special operations are uh, sometimes coordinated. I mentioned earlier the committee of heads of services and there is a subcommittee, not really like a principal committee in the US, but there's a subcommittee of deputy heads when the, uh, which they meet and they sometimes coordinate collection and special operations, not analysis. But I would say 
that most of the coordination is done informally between the agencies. The agencies coordinate between themselves. They do not need, or they do not feel that they need, it's a bit different. They do not need an, a higher echelon to authorize. Many of the things are coordinated and my feeling and my research show that there is a very, very robust and dramatic cooperation and coordination. Again, mainly in terms of collection and special operations, not in terms of analysis, but mainly directly between the agencies themselves. In Israel, in the last few decades, there have been a few attempts to a point, I won't say DNI, but a national intelligence manager or something like that. These recommendations have always failed and the heads all along these decades, the, head of, the heads of the organization said, we do not need a national manager. We coordinate good between ourselves. Again, I think it's an Israeli culture thing with pros and cons, but it's an Israeli culture. Right, let me uh, get to a question uh, Mark asks about, um, in terms of reaction time and early warning, I mean, Israel's had two, um, events in its history where it attacked a budding uh, nuclear reactor operation before uh, this became a big issue. Now, maybe the reaction times are less. Uh, is there some, how, how was uh, Israel mitigate against that in terms of how long it would take to plan an, op uh, an operation like that to take out a reactor or, or a nuclear facility? Again, you know, naturally, I cannot discuss, you know, specific operations, but I do think, and this has already been publicized, for example, regarding the Syrian nuclear reactor, it was, uh, you know, it was targeted in September 2007. It was revealed only a few years prior to that. And uh, just a few years ago, these, you know, details have been published about this. Some have criticized Israel intelligence, saying this was almost, almost a bit too late. And again, since Israeli strategic culture is a lot about preventing existential threats from materializing, uh, this is not early warning for war. It's an early warning for an emergence of a nuclear uh, challenge. Intelligence is expected to reveal this intentions and capabilities, both uh, as early as possible. You know, I do not want to discuss specific aspects, but as early as possible to give a proper, you know, time to prepare. Uh, um, again, as early as possible. One uh, question from uh, Sheila, and uh, Sheila raises the issue of uh, uh, China and the Middle East, and uh, particularly with Iran. And how, how do the Israelis uh, view this relationship? And maybe you could even expand that to the Belt and Road Initiative and other Middle Eastern countries. I think I, I would divide this very shortly on the strategic level and then as an intelligence challenge. On the strategic level, Israel has a you know, very unique, uh, 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 I would say relationship with China. You know, Israelis understand this is the US you know, great power competitor. Uh, Israelis understand that, but Israel as Israel is very pragmatic. Israel has strong economic ties with China. And as you know, Israel has been criticized explicitly by the US regarding even some of its technological cooperation with China. Mm -hmm. Israel is criticized by its greatest, and you know, I have no other word, but greatest friend in the, in the world, which is the US. So, but again, this is very Israeli, very pragmatic. Think about Ukraine, even think by the way of Israeli relations with Egypt and Jordan, uh, which are very pragmatic. So on the strategic level, I think Israel sees the pragmatic issues or, or the advantages of a, a financial cooperation uh, uh, with China and has to mitigate this with, of course, a special relationship with the US. On the intelligence level, again, without getting into too many details, naturally, this is not the focus of the Israeli intelligence uh, community. Uh, but the issue, since you know Iran, there are many Israelis who have written, it's all about Iran. Uh, I remember a few friends when I was still in service saying to us, you Israelis see, you know, three priorities, Iran, Iran, and the third one, surprisingly, is Iran. So uh, I would say that since this has a linkage to the Iranian problem, Israeli intelligence tries to understand not just the political aspect, but mainly, and I think this is a great aspect for future years, the technological cooperation 
what China can provide in terms of technology, in terms of AI and machine learning, and in terms of, of cyber. And in that case, I think this is a very typical Israeli approach to strategic intelligence. Israeli strategic intelligence does not look too far, you know, China, climate change, Russia, this is beyond our scope. But it tries to look at the implications for our small neighborhood. It's a narrow perspective of broad problems. Again, I think it's an Israeli style of strategic intelligence. Thanks. We're going to get, uh, we've got a couple of minutes left and I wanted to squeeze in another question on uh, the red teaming and devil's advocacy. Uh, and I think it's, uh, I'll boil this question down to how, I mean, you mentioned how it worked, you mentioned your participation in it and the freedom that you enjoyed doing it, but aren't there institutional drawbacks to using this approach? How did you overcome them? I think, first of all, there are institutional drawbacks. And I think the way to overcome them is really not to establish a devil's advocate department and to say to everyone, look everyone, the devil's advocate department is important. Uh, saying that would not really continue. I think the way to overcome that is really to educate, and this is how we educate our officer for contrary, uh, contrarian and disruptive thinking. Since you're you know, recruited to the IDF or to other organizations at the age of nine, 18 or 19, there are institutional drawbacks, but you, if you understand this is a mentality, and if you expect young officers to express their views and assessments, and even, again, this is Israel, Israeli intelligence officers, are expected to provide recommendations for policy and operations. Expected. I think if you educate that, this is a way to a little bit mitigate these institutional setbacks, which definitely exist. <laughs> and I'm going to combine a question here to uh, Paul asks, and one of our other uh, uh, viewers asks about the idea of strategic intelligence and its role and how and how much impact it has. And you mentioned earlier some instances in which case, of course, um, senior leadership uh, disregarded it. I mean, yes. they went all along, along their own way on it, even co contrary to what um, uh, the leader, uh, intelligence leadership wanted. Uh, but does do you see in, um, where it has had a more of an impact, especially even when uh, in terms of guiding uh, covert action, if this is something we can even talk about. But. Yes, I think in, in guiding covert action, it does have a strong influence since, you know, Mossad and Shabak, for example. Yeah. You know, it, it's not really, you know, it's not really good to compare this, you know, to CIA or FBI, but since Mossad and Shabak are intelligence organizations, but mainly operational ones, so sometimes they recommend the operation and they execute it itself. So in those cases, I think strategic intelligence has a major uh, impact. I think it does have a major impact on issue on dealing with traditional national security issues. But history has shown that when Israeli leaders and the Abraham Accords is is an exception. But in the past, when Israeli leaders such as Menachem Begin with Egypt in 1979, or Yitzhak Rabin with the Palestinians in 1993, when Israeli leaders think about dramatic, revolutionary peace agreements then Israeli strategic intelligence, you might say, is a bit too alarmistic and might have a challenge. The Abraham Accords, I think, are an exception because writ large, as was published, the Israeli intelligence community has recognized this potential for this historic uh, you know, development in the Middle East. Hi, thank you very much for uh, your, your great presentation and uh... Uh, very thorough answers to our questions. And uh, thanks to our guest today for uh, asking such great participation, asking such great questions. Um, we're all great, great to have you. And uh, we look, wish you a lot of luck on the uh, uh, PhD and we'll of course be in touch. We hope to have you back soon. And I'd like to say that our next program uh, for Inside Intelligence will be on July 20th. Eric Dahl from the Naval Postgraduate School will be with us comparing a uh, warning with 9-11 and uh, the January 6, 2021 events on the Capitol. So I uh, look forward to seeing you then. And uh, again, uh, thank you. Uh, how about nightcap at time? Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. And I see I'll send my contact details later, but 
it was a pleasure. The questions were excellent, and I really felt we had a good uh, discussion. Uh, it was really an honor for me to be here. Thank you again. It was our honor. Thanks a lot. We'll see you Thank soon. You. Bye.